We hope you enjoy today's message on Acts chapter 2 verse 38 preaching channel. Please like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to help us grow. Glory to God. We want to continue, of course, to lift our pastor up to the Lord while he is on a much-deserved and needed time of rest. It's good to be able to have a pastor that feels confident that he can be away for a little while and not have to worry about any major issues that he has good people to be able to step in and do things. I'm not speaking of myself, but I'm speaking of others that can can run things. I'm just trying to do what I can to fill a gap, but but I appreciate Sister Shauna Hoard and Brother Sean Thacker and all of those that really make things happen. They're the ones that really orchestrate everything. It's kind of like just, you know, I'm just walking up here and trying to do my little part, but I don't take it lightly. The Lord is, uh, it's an awesome thing to serve the Lord, and it's an uh, it's, uh, awesome thing to be able to minister. And I appreciate the ministry of Brother Ryman Horde earlier our personal altars, we need those. Amen. Talking last night with some board members, executive board members, about some of the challenges sometimes of speakers when they have to speak at large events such as general conference. We were trying, we were discussing policies and stuff. And a comment was made that sometimes you only have about 15 minutes to go from battle to ministry, you know, when you're dealing with certain things and that altar is important amen praise the Lord well tonight I hope that I have something that you can enjoy I know that I'm going to enjoy a little bit of it uh -oh. <clears throat> I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about the pleasures and perils of seedless fruit. Amen. You know, preachers typically have a theme that they always follow. And my theme usually always turns to food somehow. <laughs> I always just have a tendency. And you can tell I enjoy it. And, of course, my wife, being a great cook that she is, I, you know, there's just, there's no relief. I go to my annual checkup with my doctor every year, and he tells me every year, you know, you need to drop about 40 pounds. And I always tell him, I say, well, you need to talk to my wife about that. I says, because she says I have to eat what she puts in front of me. We happened to have the same general practitioner, and we had back-to-back -back appointments one day. She was, I think, coming into the lobby as I was going out of the lobby, and I had told him that, that he needs to talk to her. And so he did. But he also said, I don't think that you're the one forcing him to take that fork and put it up to his mouth. But food... It's a wonderful thing. I think I've said before that, you know, every major covenant in the Scripture revolves around food. And uh, it's, you can't even comprehend how many times God uses and Jesus used food as a symbol of symbolic meaning and spiritual meaning. Amen. And we'll probably see some of that tonight. But to launch into this discussion and this lesson tonight, I'd like to jump across several verses in the book of Genesis 
uh, chapter 1 and then chapter 2, and I have them up on the screen that you'll be able to follow along, but in case you want to use your own iPhone app or other electronic device, if you can go to the scriptures quickly, I will be in Genesis 1, 11 through 12, and then Genesis 1 and 29, and then Genesis 2 and 9, and then Genesis 2 and 16 and 17, if you can remember all that. Or you can just take the easy way out and just look at the screen up there behind me. Okay? Genesis 1, 11 through 12. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Everyone say it's good. I love food. (laughs) Genesis 1 and 29 says, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree, in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. And to you it shall be for meat. I love meat. I love fruit. Genesis 2 and 9. And out of the ground God made out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Interesting contrast there that we will talk about later. Genesis 2, 16 and 17 then admonishes man, mankind. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, some, and I love the King James Version. It has a poetic rhythm to it, you know, and it's just really good. But sometimes you get lost in all the language. And uh, so I want to read a couple of scriptures. This is not on the screen, but uh, I want to read a couple of those same scriptures to you out of the NIV, uh, which translates probably more into, you know, common day language for us. And uh, I won't do all the, all the verses, but... I want to do the uh, primary ones that are quote that quote God in what He said in Genesis one twenty nine. God said, "I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food." And then in Genesis two and nine, the NIV says that the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then finally in Genesis 2 and 16 and 17 is where he says, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. As I said, I really enjoy food. I enjoy fruit. I especially enjoy seedless fruit. Seedless fruit. I'm going to make all of you hungry. But I haven't had dinner yet. Most of you probably have. Seedless fruit has a lot of advantages over seeded fruit. It's designed for ease of consumption. All you do is pop it in your mouth and you eat it and you swallow it. You can bite into it without any worries of broken tooth, without any concerns, 
without any kind of jarring experience. You ever bit into something and it's hard and you, you didn't think it was going to be hard? And you bit into that and it's like, oh, that hurt. You don't have to worry about that with all this seedless fruit. There's no unexpected surprises in it. There's no concern of swallowing seeds. You know, when I was younger, we used to eat watermelons all the time when I was a kid. And, of course, my mother admonished me, don't swallow the seeds. They're going to grow inside of you and grow out of your belly button. You ever heard that one? You know, don't eat those seeds. Surely, we, you know, we know better now, but uh, to a six- or seven-year-old kid, man, you're just imagining all these things. But with seedless fruit, you don't have to worry about all that. There's no concern about swallowing or choking on the seed. There's no risk involved. There is just simply pure pleasure. Everyone say, you're just so wrong. Yeah. I know. That's okay. <clears throat> seedless fruit. I don't know if you know this, but bananas are seedless fruits. Let me rephrase that. <clears throat> Commercial bananas are seedless fruit. When you open up a banana, you see these little black dots in there in a commercial banana. That was intended to be a seed, but it never developed into a seed. In fact, if you bite into a wild banana, a natural banana, you would encounter some very large seeds about the size of a pea. But through commercialization, which we'll talk about in a minute, we got rid of those seeds. And we have a nice seedless fruit here. Because you see, seeded fruit, unlike seedless fruit, must be consumed more cautiously. You must be a little bit more careful about how you consume it. We don't like that in our world. It requires a little bit more evaluation and an intro, in, introspection into what it is that you're actually eating. You have to kind of anticipate the dilemma that you know is going to be inside of that fruit and so you have to take little bitty bites and nibble it. You ever eaten a seeded grape? I'm sure you have. It's been a long time since I've had one because I enjoy seedless grapes so much. But these seeded grapes, you have to just simply take, you know, little bites, you know. And then you got to find a way to get that seed out of there or you just spit it out, you know. <laughs> but with seedless grapes, you just pop them one right after the other. Boom, 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 boom. Easy, gluttonous, you know? Unfortunately, though, the seed is the source of life. And even though they're not very pleasant eating experience, they are very necessary. You know, in the early 1970s, there was, um, some may recognize the name, Irma Bombeck. She was a well-known author and humorist. She wrote several best-selling books about the challenges in life, and one of her books was titled, The Grass is Always Greener Over the Septic Tank. And the other one was titled, If Life is a Bowl of Cherries, Then Why Am I in the Pits? And, of course, in her book, she had some very expressive tongue-in-cheek anecdotes about life and some colorful stories. And she was known for her humorous comments such as, insanity is hereditary. You can catch it from your kids. <laughs> and children should be judged for what they really are, a punishment for early marriage. 
And then she goes on to say, my second favorite household chore is ironing. My first one is hitting my head on the top bunk bed until I faint. And then she says, never loan your car to anyone to whom you've given birth. And finally, she says, I did not fight my way to the top of the food chain to become a vegetarian. Some humorous comments. And in stating the humorous in a hyperbolic fashion, she, of course, illustrated the struggles that we often encounter and face with life's seeds. Because seeds are not very sweet, like the fruit around them. They are usually bitter. They're hard. They're hard to consume. And there's very little pleasure in them. But they are very necessary because they are the source of life. We may want to ask ourselves, why can't all fruit be seedless? Why can't all fruit be so palatable and easy to consume and convenient? Well, first of all, let's clear a couple things up. And I'm not a botanist nor a horticulturist. Ever how you say that word. But first of all, seedless fruit is a little bit of an oxymoron. Because botanically speaking, the definition of a fruit is the mature ovary of a plant that contains the seeds. So therefore, without the seeds, it's really not considered a fruit. And so a seedless fruit really is an oxymoron. It is an unnatural event to have seedless fruit. They must be artificially generated. They are not God-made. It's not how God intended fruit to be. God said, let the earth bring forth grass and the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself. In other words, let the tree bring forth fruit that has seed in it, not seedless fruit. So how exactly do we get seedless fruit? Well, as I've already mentioned, it must have some external intervention, some type of artificial manipulation or genetic mutation, either naturally or forced. One method is to prevent the flower from being properly pollinated or fertilized while allowing the fruit to mature. And this is typically accomplished by hybridization of incompatible chromosomes. Or in other words, cross-breeding incompatible species of fruit. Let that sink in for a minute. Forcing the crossbreeding of incompatible species so that the seed is not properly fertilized or pollinated. Can I stop just for a minute on this biology lesson, I guess, or botany lesson, and simply tell us that There is an intended natural progression of creation and life that God has instituted from the beginning. And there is an enemy that tries to unnaturally manipulate, mutilate, and abort the seed of life that is in us. We need to be properly pollinated. We need to be properly fertilized. We need to be able to grow to maturity. We need to be exposed to the right species and the right environment for proper fertilization. It needs to be seed of like kind. When we crossbreed with the world, it produces incompatible chromosomes resulting in seedless fruit. 
The Leviticus law even forbade the sowing of unlike seeds in the same field. Because there was an understood principle that unlike seeds do not properly germinate and pollinate, resulting in seedlessness, which is the absence of life. Symbolic. Another method of producing seedless fruit is to abort the fertilized embryonic seed during development. In such cases, the fertilization takes place, the pollination takes place, but either by natural or forced genetic mutations by the application of certain hormones and chemicals, it will cause a miscarriage. The seed aborts. It is... Unnatural. It's interesting, of course, when it comes to things of creation. Mankind finds itself tinkering with these very same genetic concepts in genetically modifying plants, animals, and ultimately even humans. We toy with things such as gender selection and selective abortion. We find ourselves wanting to be like God, trying to bypass the natural process of creative reproduction by eliminating the seed. We don't really have need of the seed. There's no need to have a man and a wife in order to produce. There's no need to have male and female. We can have same-sex unions. We can generate offspring without it. That's where we are as a society. It's unnatural and it's deceptive. Because in its very nature, seedlessness or seedless fruit is deceptive because it looks just like the seeded fruit. If I did not know that this was a seedless grape by looking at the label when I bought it, I wouldn't know if that was seedless or not. Unless, of course, I bit into it. I'm enjoying this. (laughs) When you bite into the fruit is the only time you know if it's seedless or not. Unless you know the source of that fruit. Unless you know where that fruit came from, then you have no idea whether or not this banana is seedless or seeded. Jesus says, I am the true vine. There is a true source of fruit. There is a true source of life. Praise God. He says, I am the true vine. And this message, of course, implies that there is a false. There is a deception. There is a vine that does not have life in it. It looks like the real thing. It feels like the real thing. It tastes like the real thing. But there's no life in it. There is no seed. Can I be so bold as to say that all that the world can offer you is seedless fruit? Even fruit that appears to be like the fruit of the Spirit. You know, the world does experience love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. The world has all that. They have love without commitment or sacrifice. I think they call it friends with benefits or something like that. I don't know. They have temporal joy and pleasure with no eternal hope or life. They have a false peace 
of coexistence. You ever see that sticker? Let's just coexist. Let's just get along. Let's just, you know, peace. Back in the 60s, you know, they used to, you know, that was the thing there, you know, peace. Some of you can remember that. Most of you probably can't, you know. Peace, brother, peace. No war, no conflict. It's a false peace. There's no such thing as right and wrong. Let's just coexist. Long-suffering, tolerance. Oh, there's a key word. Tolerance, long-suffering. Oh, yes. We need to be tolerant of one another's diversity and immorality. We don't need to define what is sin. Because once you do, you start condemning. And we don't want to judge or condemn Faith without works. Oh, I could go on and on, but even in the religious world, the society of today, and, and you know the pastor's taught on it many times, but there's a big difference between religion and experience and, and faith and transformation. It, and it's really all about Transformation. The world experiences remorse without repentance. They have image without substance. Peter, of course, likened it in 2 Peter chapter 2 as wells without water. It's dead fruit. It's just, it's dead. I mean, there's, there's nothing. There's nothing here. In fact, when you're talking about seedless fruit... You also have to ask yourself, well, how do you propagate seedless fruit? How do you reproduce it? Because, you see, seedless fruit, because it has no life and no seed in it, once you get through consuming all of this right here, which hopefully I'll be able to do before the night's over, Once you get through consuming all of this, there's nothing left. It's gone. It's temporal. You have nothing but an empty plate and empty hands. You have nothing remaining. There's no seed that you can go out and plant to get more. There's nothing there. It's really a facade. It's really a mirage because there's nothing of sustenance there. So how do you really get seedless fruit? Or how does it propagate itself? And I've already mentioned some of the the, the concepts of what it is, but propagation is really done by replication and not by reproduction. Replication is accomplished by repeating the same unnatural process over and over again. You must force crossbreeding in order to abort the seed. And then you must do it again. And then you must do it again. And it's just a comp- constant repetition of the same unnatural process. It's a death spiral. External process that God never intended. Another replication method of propagating seedless fruit is by grafting. Once you've developed a seedless fruit, you can take a branch of that seedless tree once you have um, genetically mutated it, and you can graft it into the root system of another tree. And it becomes like a parasite growing and thriving off of the nutrients provided, of course, by another's root system. And so then you have two trees. Because if you have a tree that produces seedless fruit, it can't reproduce itself. And so the only way you can reproduce that tree is to cut a branch off, take it over here to this tree, and graft it into another tree. And so now you have two trees. 
They're exact clones of each other. Their DNA and their chromosomes are exactly the same. There is no relational partnership or relationship that exists. The fruit also has nothing to offer back to the next generation of the species. It has no seed to offer back. There's no commitment. There's no covenant relationship. It stands alone and dies alone because it has no way of reproducing itself. It can only be replicated by external methods. And it really goes to the heart of the matter because the real purpose of fruit is to carry the seed. That's the whole purpose of fruit. The fruit is designed to cover and protect the seed. The fruit is what makes the seed attractive and desirable. It is the reason the fruit tastes so sweet and so good is so that someone will pick it up and eat the fruit and then get to the seed and throw it on the ground. So that that way it propagates itself. That's the purpose and the point of the fruit. The most important aspect of life and creation is the seed, not the fruit. The fruit is the blessings and the trimmings and the benefits of a mature seed. Life is not about the fruit. Life is about the seed. Life is not a bowl of cher cherries. If anything, life is a bowl of cherry seeds. That's what life is. And some people may call it the pits. But the seed is the most important aspect of life. The seed is the fertilized and mature reproductive organ of a flowering plant that enables that species to continue to perpetuate itself. And there is significant spiritual symbolism in that. Because God's covenant was made with the seed of Abraham, not the fruit of Abraham. It is the seed that has generational covenant. And without the seed, you have no covenant. God blessed Abraham with fruit. But the fruit was a byproduct of the mature seed that was planted in him and allowed to grow to maturity. Genesis 3.16 says this, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. It wasn't to Abraham and his fruit or his blessings. It was the seed. Now you might say, well, Acts 2.30 says, Therefore being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. The fruit of the loins, of course, is a phrase, as we know, representing the, the seed that comes out of man. That covenant relationship exists between God and his people and the seed of that people. The gospel message is about the seed, not the fruit. It is the death, 
the burial, and the resurrection. Praise God. This cannot die and be buried and then rise again because there's nothing in it. There's no seed in it. And without seed, you do not have a gospel because the gospel requires the death, the burial, and the resurrection of life. Praise God. And if all we have is seedless fruit, we can consume all of it we want. But we can never experience the gospel. Second Timothy 2 and 8. Remember, and this is so important. Remember, That Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. That was the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy. And what is he saying? Jesus is the seed. Think about that. Jesus is the seed. To Abraham and his seed, and that scripture goes on to say, he did not say seeds as in plural, and that's another whole discussion we can get into about how confident the the, uh, Apostle Paul was in the anointing of the word of God where he took a singular word, seed, and he made a doctrine out of the fact that it was not plural seeds. I'm going to end up choking on this stuff. It deserves me right. (laughs) All right. That's okay. But Jesus Christ is the seed. That's why Satan fights so hard to destroy it. That's why Satan fights to destroy the concept of creation. And the origin of creation and the origin of life. He wants to eliminate the seed. You know, I got to check my time. Yeah, okay, I'm going to try to hurry up. <clears throat> my wife told me, she said, you know, I'm, I never get through in Sunday school teaching. And on Wednesday nights, I have no time limit. I don't have to worry about stopping it five minutes to one. But I will try to hurry. And just so you'll know, too, I'm, I used to teach. I don't want to get into a lot because I'm burning up my time. But I used to teach uh, at an a adult a technical college, and we had five-hour courses. Okay, and I would lecture for five hours, actually two and a half, and then a 30-minute break or a 15-minute break in there, and then two and, two and a half more hours or so like that, but intensive. I did that for years, so I'm accustomed to it. And so <clears throat> I'll not do that tonight. I'm going to wrap up here hopefully in a little bit. But there is a difference also between the seed and the plant which comes from the seed. That which is planted is not that which it produces. Second, um, 1 Corinthians 15 and 37 tells us, That which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain, but God giveth it a body. What is the body of a seed? The fruit. That's the body of a seed. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, 
and to every seed his own body. That which we shall be is not what we are. Right. Come on. Right. What we are is a seed. That's good. We are a seed that Satan is trying to abort. Right. That's good. Trying to mutate. Trying to destroy. Come on. Because we represent creation. Right. We represent the the manifestation of God in the flesh. We represent the seed of Abraham. And what this corruptible body is is not what it will produce if we allow it to grow into maturity. But we shall receive a glorious body. We shall receive an incorruptible body. For this corruption must put on incorruption. And this mortality must put on immortality. And so what we are as a seed in the form of a seed is not what we shall be as a plant. When this seed goes into the ground, is buried, and then is resurrected according to his gospel. Praise God. 2 Corinthians, our second, uh, yeah, 2 Corinthians 5 and 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God. This is saying it the same thing in different terms. And house made with, uh, a house not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, Earnestly, there's, there's that death and that dying. In this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. I know there's a lot of language in here in the King James Version that, that kind of gets confusing, but hopefully I can clarify it in a minute. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up in life. Now what is he saying? We're going through life. We're groaning. We're struggling. We're dying. We don't want to be naked. We don't want to be exposed. We want the covering of the fruit. But that's not the real point in life. Everyone likes to have the blessings of God. But we have this confidence that if we dissolve, if we go into the ground and dissolve, if we die, We know that we have a new house, a new body, a new covering, a new fruit, a new plant. Not made with hands, but eternal. And I'm going to try to wrap up with this tonight, but I find it interesting. In Genesis, of course, 11 and 12. We read about the fact that God spoke to the earth and told it to bring forth grass, herb yielding seed, the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And he said, that's good. I like that. And then in Genesis 1 and 29, we read... Where God said, Behold, I have given you, speaking to Adam, every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth and every tree in which the fruit contains seed. To you it shall be for meat. Then we jump down to 2 and 9, where he tells 
Adam, do not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now let me restate that. God made every tree that was good to eat come up out of the ground. And God said, every tree that bears fruit in which there is seed, life, you may freely eat. But of that tree, you shall not eat of it. And I can only conclude that that tree had no seed. That tree was a tree of death. That tree was a mutated, aborted replica of something that God did not put there. Because it said that God made out of the, God out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And then it puts a period there and says, oh, by the way, the tree of life is also in the midst of the garden, and so is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then he says, don't touch that tree over there called the knowledge of good and evil. There was something tainted about it. There was something artificial about it. There was something corrupted about it. Knowledge puffeth up. Love edifieth. Knowledge has no real seed or substance in it. Our efforts of trying to be like God, it has no seed. There's no life in that. But if we are willing to allow our seed to mature, in this life, and I may teach on this next week, we will receive the blessings of God in the abundance of the fruit that surrounds that seed. But keep in mind that this body is temporal, and this seed has a purpose. And that seed's purpose is to die and be buried so that it can be resurrected in a glorified fashion. Praise God. Let's stand to our feet and just worship the Lord today and magnify Him and exalt Him. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we praise You. We magnify You, O God, and we exalt You, Lord. We glorify You, O God, in the name of Jesus. Oh, thank You, Father, in the name of Jesus, we glorify You. We praise You, Lord. I thank You, Father, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Why don't we all just gather around the front tonight and just, just begin to thank the Lord, amen, for his blessings. And, and let's be prepared to plant these seeds. But let's also allow the maturity. Let's allow the proper fertilization, the proper pollination. Let's resist the devil and his effort to abort the seed that God has planted in us but let's allow it to grow to maturity and reap the benefits of the fruit while on this earth but yet be prepared for the glory of God to be manifested when we put this old body off and we are resurrected oh thank you Jesus